From one islander to another, Isle of Wight Radio proudly presents John Hannam Meets. Hi, and welcome to another John Hannam Meets. Today, we're going to celebrate the life of Bill Maynard, who died in late March 2018. So, it's a Hannam archive that goes back to 1996 at the Yvonne Arnaud Theatre in Guildford. John Hannam meets from the archive. Delighted to welcome Bill Maynard to John Hannah Meeks. Bill, nice to see you. Yeah, it's nice to see you again, John. I want to go back to when you were a footballer for Kettering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you sort of have aspirations to become a league footballer? Oh, yeah. Well, I had actually been on the books of Leicester City, and um, I went to Notts County for a while as well. But Kettering Town came up with a bit more money. Um, in those days, you know, one played for about 35 bob a week or something like that. And I think they offered about three quid. Um, unfortunately, I got what is known as a divided cruciate, which is a knee injury that in those days used to put you out of the game. They can repair it now because Gascoigne got one, the same the same injury. But of course, Clough got one as well. And uh, with Clough and Gascoigne and me all getting the same injury, I always sort of thought it was the injury that seemed to go straight from your knee to your mouth. <laughs> Then you became Billy Williams, sort of entertainer. Ah, well, I was Billy Williams a long time before that. Mm. I was, when I was eight years old, I started being an entertainer on the clubs. And there used to be a, um, a, a, a very famous comedian in the old days, in the 1900s, called Billy Williams, the man in the velvet suit. Well, I used to be known as Little Billy Williams, the boy in the velvet suit. <laughs> and I used to, in those days, I used to do nine entirely different acts. You know, I used to play instruments and do impressions. And, and I was in drag by the time I was about nine. I, was, <laughs> I used to do an act with a song that went, I'm knitting a singlet for Cecil, a nice woolly singlet for Cecil. <laughs> It'll keep him as snug as a bug in a rug, as in my embraces he'll nestle. And I used to do a load of jokes about my boyfriend Cecil and all that. And I, I used to do a, a spot as a as a soldier when I, I did a song called Oh the Colonel Was So Kind and Gentle and it went on from there when I was about sort of 14 I started playing football seriously and I was going to make that my career but unfortunately my knee put me out of it so by the time I was about 16 and a half 17 I, I, I then um, I, I, I finished in football and I started um, back being a, a band singer at that period until eventually I, I you know I started on the clubs again doing um, the odd joke as well as singing a few songs and um, and I, I eventually went to Butlins which was my first sort of real professional job and went on from there. Skegness? Butlins, Skegness and then on to Filey the next year and uh, then teamed up with my agent uh, that was where I, actually at Butlins, I sort of teamed up with Terry Scott. We were never a double act, but he was the principal comic and I was sort of his stooge stroke assistant. And then many years afterwards, our agent uh, put us together in, a, in the television show Great Scott, It's Maynard, which... Um, sort of where I created the image of being the sweater boy, you know. And, That's uh, right. <laughs> when it went on from there. You were very slim in those days too, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, eight, 11 stone 7. I was, <laughs> yeah, that was my sort of fighting weight, as it were. You also made a record, I think, in around in the 50s, did you? Oh, I made lots of records. I made lots of records. I was actually second in the Eurovision Song Contest in 1957, singing a song called Don't Cry, Little Doll. Um, I, I had one or two skiffle records that, um, you know, sort of showed a bit of promise. Um, I, I made, um, and I have been making records, really, I suppose, all, all through my career. I've, I've made one about every sort of 15 or 20 years. In fact, I, I just made two last year. One was, strangely enough, a version of Heartbeat, which is a country version of Heartbeat, because I love country music. And uh, I've made one which is for release next year, in the middle of heartbeat, I am told, of the old uh, Rolling Stones hit, uh, Walking the Dog. That obviously goes back to your sort of singing with big bands, Bill, really, does it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and the thing is that I've sort of been, I suppose, um, a, vi a very diverse um, figure in, in, in the theatre because I've tried to do as many different things. I mean, when I was at sort of at the 
first height of my success, I suppose. In 1957, I opted out of television and went into rep because I wanted to learn to be an actor, because I basically wanted to be a, a film actor. I didn't realise that being an actor tended to get in the way. Well, you talked for a while about Great Scott, It's May Now, because it was sort of a, a sitcom, and it was different, wasn't it, really? Yeah, it was. A, it was a, that was um, the first time I sort of... Um, put my foot down on things and uh, at that time there weren't any sort of sitcoms that, and that was the first ever storyline show, we did a different storyline, a send up of something every week, we'd do a send up of um, Holmes and Watson or we'd do uh, you know, a send up of um, of like the Makepeace family you know, in the north and like, uh, like Brass became eventually or uh, we'd do a send up of two cowboys you know like the uh, out in the wild west we do a send up of a spoof of a cowboy thing you know we we even did a spoof of joe macbeth in which we did a thing called joe cinderella and it was about this guy called uh, joe who was always left at home when they went out on robberies you know great memories of that particular show yeah, it taught me an enormous amount because it was my first real television series. Was Great Scottish Maynard, and it was, um, yeah, it was it was a great teacher. But I've I've tried to learn Malcolm as I. <laughs> well, at least your listeners will know that we're in my dressing room, <laughs> Yvonne Arn of the editor, because you'll you'll hear things coming over the tunnel. You can, we can't stop that. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I've tried to learn as I've gone through every aspect of the business. Um, I've tried, you know, I've done like like cabaret, concerts, summer seasons, pantomimes, um, dramatic plays, um, classics, you know, including Shakespeare and things. In fact, the last Shakespearean role I did, which I said was going to be my my swan song on the stage was when I did Falstaff uh, at Chichester, you know, the, uh, mm. the, the festival. And, and that was... I felt that was the right thing to finish on. But in the old days, in the 50s and 60s on the Isle of Wight, there was sort of a Sunday concerts. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The two theatres used to come on that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, when I did this, I used to love doing Sunday concerts. I used to go, and, and the, the Isle of Wight was one of them, where we used to come, come over and do Sunday concerts. I never actually did a season there. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd go anywhere to do Sunday concerts because, strangely enough, you used to be paid as much for a Sunday concert, usually, as you did for the whole week. They were a good, they were a good earner in those days. They used to actually transfer you from one theatre to another by taxi, so you did two for one. Do you remember that? That's, that's right. Well, actually, when we went to Butlins, because I used to, after I'd played at Butlins, I used to go back when I'd been on the telly, as it were, and I was a personality or a celebrity, whatever you know. Um, I used to go back there, and sometimes you'd do six in an evening and they used to take you by a sort of mini coach Did they? yeah and sometimes the star of the evening would go on sort of second or something and then the hoi polloi had to follow him. I remember once, I once had to follow Tommy Trinder. When I was a member of the review company, Trinder was the big star who came for the Sunday concert and I had to follow him, and I said, um, I, I, I've got to follow you, Mr. Trinder. And he said, oh, don't worry, son, you'll be all right. And he actually, before he finished, he said, right, I've got to go and do another show now. But he said, there's a young man coming on. And I said, he said, it's very hard for, for youngsters to follow us established people. So, you know, he's, he's a very nice lad and a good comic. So, so you know, I hope you enjoy him, he, which I thought was very sweet of him. He was a good comic, wasn't he? Yeah, and a nice man, too. Mm. Um, and I've tried to sort of do that sort of thing for for other for, <laughs> there's so many people wanted by the switchboard today and you can't even switch it off um yeah so i've 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 tried to sort of carry on that tradition i mean i was helped by so many people john pertwee helped me enormously in my early days we did tours of korea together you know for the army mm. and things like that and and john helped me enormously izzy bomb was another great man who helped me fantastically in my young days to to just encourage me and tell me how to do things and and learning from those old performers was wonderful i think it's one of the things that is you know that the youngsters don't get today because today you're on your own they only use and if you're doing a stand-up act they only usually have the one and there's no there's none of the older comics who can tell you because unfortunately they've all gone the only people who could tell you are people who are stand-up comics themselves now today and 
most of them, unfortunately, never had that background, and most of them, unfortunately, have to do obscene material. You know, mm. uh, it's 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 a shame. I think it's a crying shame when I look back and think of the, the people who got by on timing. It's like in this pantomime I'm doing now, the Yvonne Arno. It, there's not there's not a questionable joke in it, and everybody's saying it's wonderful to see a wholesome pantomime. I've been to see a couple, and I'm I'm appalled at some of the material that they use uh, in the guise of comedy for, mm. for 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 children to listen to. I, it's it's so I think it's so wrong. Okay, let's meet the families. Oh, sorry, wrong show. I'm Les Dennis, but you're listening to John Hannah Meets on Isle of Wight Radio, in person interview. My current guest is Bill Maynard, one of Britain's most favourite actors currently in the wonderful series Heartbeat. We're looking back on Bill's early days when he was a top stand-up comedian. Then, Bill, you moved into comedy. Some said you were you were silly. You gave up sort of £1,000 a week and you took £50 a week in rep. Yes, well, that was because, as I said before, that was because I, I wanted to be an actor, basically, but I came from the lower working class. And in those days, when you came from that, that group, you didn't go to drama school. That's the way you became an actor. You had to go to drama school, and to go to drama school, somebody had to pay. And, of course, in those days, I mean, we were lucky to get enough to survive, let alone, you know, go to drama school. So to be a performer, you had to go into the clubs and you know, whatever. Um, and so I'd always aspired to be an actor, and I thought, and I wanted to be a film actor as well, and I thought to be an actor, you had to know to be a film actor, especially, you had to know how to act. I didn't realise until I started doing it that it could tend to get in the way, because the most easy way to do it is to be a personality, you know. If they want a, a 25-year-old cockney lad, they go and find one. If they want a 70-year-old... Um, Irish drunk, they go and find an actor who is Irish, 75, and has probably drunk a bit in his time. So now they don't ask you to be... There are very few character actors left. In fact, I honestly believe I'm one of the few um, because it's wonderful the way that um, in the North the people have accepted me being a Northern person, um, which I'm not because I was born in Farnham in Surrey and I was brought up in Leicestershire. And the only th reason that I, I seem to have done most of my work for Yorkshire Television or Granada. And uh, because of that, that time, it seems that I have played mostly Yorkshiremen. And so people accept. I mean, I am now sometimes referred to as the Northern Actor, which basically, um, all right, I'm from the Midlands, and I suppose people on the Isle of Wight, and that is the North, but <laughs> I assure you it's not, because it's, it, it, the, the, the accent around where I live is much more akin to the Birmingham. In fact, when I did the gaffer, I always thought that I, I, I wanted to do that with a black country accent, because that's where all, a lot of these engineering companies are based. But unfortunately, Yorkshire Television wanted it to be based in Leeds, wanted the factory to be based in Leeds, obviously, for cost. So again, the gaffer had to be somebody who came from Leeds. Bill, what I've always admired in you, you had rough times in the 50s and 60s, you were bankrupt for a while and you had a big tax demand, and you kept working, you kept, you kept going, didn't you? Well, I yes, because you see, although although I lost um, all my money, I only actually lost that once. Um, but in '62, that saved me, though, as I think, as a person, and certainly saved my marriage and things like that. Because I was a bit, at those, that time, I was a bit Jack the Lad. I used to drink a lot and Did you? yes, do all the sort of things. You know, I used to find you know ladies very attractive <laughs> and uh, but then again who doesn't and, quite right uh, <laughs> and so i sort of did all the things really i shouldn't do and i was becoming a bit of a pain i mean i'm still a pain i think to a lot of people in the business but at least i know i am now you're a nice pain <laughs> <laughs> no i think no i think i'm a pain now but i'm a pain um for a very good reason i it, it now it only becomes a pain when i'm because I do stamp my foot a bit because I feel a great responsibility to the public. With anything I do, I, I, it's easy to keep your mouth shut. And I think there's far too much fear um, in our business. You know, there are a lot of producers, not all of them by any stretch of the imagination, but a lot of them are on a bit of an ego trip and they try to turn actors into puppets. And I'm afraid a lot of people do accept it. 
but I've never been like that. And uh, I think when you've been a comic, you see the basic difference, I've always thought between a comic and an actor doing comedy is an actor hopes to get laughs, but a comic has to get laughs. And I think there's a great amount of um, difference in your attitude when it comes to that. Um, it's all right going on and blaming somebody else, but when you've been a stand-up comic, there's nobody to blame. And so you know at the end of the day, it's your responsibility. And I think that's one of the things that makes me, I suppose, what I am. I mean, I still fight day to day. Well, I don't have to fight now. But, I mean, I have had to fight in heartbeat with one or two of the producers who have now who are now gone, I'm delighted to say. <laughs> um, and, and I've always had the great support of the... Um, of the sort of executive producer, I could always his door was always open to me. So thank goodness he was there. But but um, you do take a bit of a chance, you know, when you when you confront them, as it were. And you when you do that, you better be right as well, because if you ain't right, they're at you like a pack of wolves. Bill, when you were quite low in the business, did you ever think of giving up or not really? Oh yes, I did. I did. I mean, there was one period, in fact, after we'd lost the money and things like that, and uh, I, I was still getting accolades artistically, um, if not a lot of money. I did some wonderful, wonderful uh, jobs, you know, at uh, Nottingham Playhouse, uh, mostly. I mean, I was allowed to do a lot, a lot of the, the parts I'd always wanted to play. And so that was wonderful for me artistically, but financially it was bad. And because I'd been into many, many big houses and as an entertainer or a guest or something, and I'd mixed a lot with the sort of people downstairs, you know, and all of a sudden they'd cut off a bit of meat or something and say, here, have this, it's too good for them up there. Or they'd open a bottle of the wine, they'd taste it and say, all oh, that, we'll have that, you know, send, send the rubbish upstairs. And I thought, wait a minute, these people lead a wonderful life. And so at one stage, I actually put an advert into, into a, an American paper advertising my wife and I as British Shakespeare and actor and wife desire posters um, butler stroke housekeeper did you? yeah well I thought to myself here you are you can go there you drive around in a Cadillac you you have no financial responsibilities whatsoever you are kept you eat and drink the best and and I've played many a butler and I thought being um, at that time having uh, being at, the, at that period, in the middle of doing a lot of Shakespeare, I could, you know, sort of curtsy and, and bow with the best of them <laughs> and, uh, and say, uh, good morning, my lord, and, uh, or sire, or something. And I thought this would be very easy to play. My wife was a wonderful, wonderful cook and could do absolutely anything and could paint and sew and decorate and and I said let's do that and in fact there was a period we we actually were almost poised to go to to be with a family in New Hampshire when I got my first film and it stopped us from going you're listening to Isle of Wight radio and don't miss John Hannah Mates because you like it not a lot but you like it currently I'm with Bill Maynard one of my favorite actors and he was a great comedy favorite of mine back in the 50s and 60s I think I saw you in a thing called Kisses at 50, which gave me a completely different outlook on Bill Maynard. That was a sort of a, a big hit. Yes, what actually happened was, after I'd opted out of television and I'd been into rep, and, and you know, and everything, I'd lost all my money and all that sort of thing, and I thought, have I done the right thing? Right out of the blue, I think by this time I'd done my first film and, but, and a couple of small bits and pieces, not, nothing much. But right out of the blue, my first television play dramatic television play was a thing called Paper Roses by Dennis Potter one of his first and I did this many 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 years ago and I played the, this f f character called Clarence Hubbard who was the, le the lead in it and and this was very well received by people in the industry because it was about a newspaper man and then s six months later I got another um, offer to do Kisses at 50 by Colin Welland, playing this bloke who left his wife because he fell for a barmaid on his 50th birthday. And this won the BAFTA award and sort of established me then as a dramatic actor. Um, and that was exactly what I wanted. And then about six months later, I was offered a part in a sitcom for Granada, a thing called The Life of Riley, playing a sort of randy insurance man. <laughs> and I did that, and the first one went to number one 
in the network ratings above Coronation Street. And it was unbelievable. So here am I, I've spent all this time, and I'm back again being a comic. It was, it was amazing. Then, of course, came Selwyn Froggett, which so many people remember you for with great affection, and the gaffer. So there was a sort of a trio of really big hit shows, Bill. Yeah, 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 they were. Well, as I say, after I'd done, after I'd done that, um, I, after I'd done the life of Riley, as I say, yeah, I am back being a... Selwyn Froggett was a thing that I'd had, that I'd sort of conceived. It was based on a bloke who lives in my village. And strangely enough, when I did Bottom in A Midsummer Night's Dream many years before, I'd based the characterization of this chap of, of, of bottom on this chap in my village and so what it did it that came full circle because when the BBC actually asked me Duncan Wood who was at the BBC said have you got any ideas and I said yes I would like to play bottom brought up to date and what Selwyn Frog it really was was bottom from a Midsummer Night's Dream and the the club committee were the mechanicals that's how I saw it and uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that, again, went to network number one, again, over Coronation Street and Crossroads, which was <laughs> sensational. Um, after that, of course, because I'd done Selwyn Frog, and it was such a character, I wanted something sort of entirely different. And uh, Selwyn had been a, you know, a, a, a naive, open, boyish character. So I wanted somebody cynical and scheming and all of that. And that is where the gaffer came in, which Duncan Wood actually discovered for me. It was an old radio play. And he said, what do you think of this? And I looked at it and I said, yes. That is when I said, I'd like to play him, though, as it, you know, because I want an entirely different character. I'd like to play, play him based in the, in the black country. So he has a black country accent. And, uh, but unfortunately, as I said before, it had to be done in Leeds. And again, it was a Yorkshire man. But it, if it had been, if it had been uh, a black country character, it would have been entirely different to Selwyn. Whereas, unfortunately, it was the same accent. So after 15 years of struggle, three enormous hits. It was wonderful, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely fantastic. And in between those, of course, we had things like um, uh, The Inheritors and Trinity Tales and all sorts of different straight plays as well were going on at the same time. John Hannum, can't cook, won't cook, but what a sexy voice. One of my ambitions in the six years of this show is actually to interview one of my favourite TV characters, Claude Jeremiah Greengrass from Heartbeat, and he's with me. So let's talk about Heartbeat. That was a great success story. It has been, hasn't it? Yes, it was an amazing story as well, because I was, you know, um, basically I'd retired, really, and all I was doing was I thought, I'd do the odd pantomime, I'll do the odd film if it comes up. And I got a phone call to say that Yorkshire Television had got this programme and they felt it needed um, another character putting into it. I think they'd done one of them or something. And uh, they'd got this character, they said, it's only about four lines, <laughs> but we'd like you to do eight of them to see if you can make something of the character. Because although we don't, you know, fancy the series, you know, going far, we think it might c turn into a spin-off for this character, Greengrass, if you can do something with it. So it literally was four lines, but they gave me carte blanche, and I went into it, and in, the rest is sort of history. I mean, and, and people say, ah, it's because of this, it's because of that, it's because, it's because of nothing, because they put it on at 9.30 on Friday night which is the time when normally you put something that you're trying to hide. And the first episode went into number seven in the network ratings. Yeah. And everybody was absolutely astounded. And it's just gone on from there. And any idea of it turning into a, you know, a spin-off for Greengrass has long, <laughs> long been forgotten. You're into everything in that, aren't you? Any fiddle going, you're there, really. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, again, I, I was allowed to base the character. I mean, even the clothes and you know, the army greatcoat and all that I created myself. You know, the mittens, the, the scarf, you know. Created the character, the twitch, the, everything that's in it. The only <laughs> thing I didn't actually put into it was the dog, which is a godsend as well. I mean, he's the most wonderful dog. Um, he's lovely, isn't he? Oh, he's... he's Alf, he's, isn't it? Alfie? Alfred. Alfred, Alfred, Alfred yeah. Alfred, he's so... He's so lovely. I don't, I'm not, I don't call him Alfred very often because his real name is Tramp. Right. And if I call him Alfred, he doesn't know who I'm talking about. So what I've done is I call him Son all the time. And actually, that's what he is to Greengrass. He's like a son. I mean, uh, if anybody touches his dog, you know, he said, touch my dog and you touch me. You know, he's the one 
real mate he's got. So no plans for you to come out of that series because, you know, you're so popular in it. Well, no, there, there are no plans for me to come out of it. Um, I don't quite know what's going to happen. Um, Nick Berry, who, who plays the lead in it, uh, he um, has been going to come out of it ever since he's been in it. And he was supposed to be coming out of it at the end of next year, at the end of 97. We're doing 24 next year. And he was supposed to be coming out after he'd done either 16. It, it was 16, then it was going to be 18. And he was coming out of it. But I heard only yesterday that there may be a, he may be wanting to stay now. You know, so I, I don't know what's happening. I mean, if he goes out of it, it it'll just, I mean, they've told me it'll just go on forever. Wonderful. And it's a wonderful job. I mean, it's frankly, you know, when I look back on my career, it's easily the easiest job I've ever had in my life. I mean, to do drama on television is so simple. I mean, honestly, they can almost take people off the street and put them... Under. I don't believe you. Well, they can, so long as they don't ask them to do comedy. Yeah. I mean, they can. They can if, you take, if you take somebody like Jimmy Nail, who was, you know, a, mm. a, a singer in a group, mm. and they took him straight from that. You know, and put him never acted in his life apparently. Put him straight. And there's so many people they can take with very little experience. You know, they can take them straight from drama school if they've been there, or they can take them straight from anything. And if you if you see if you see the people in Coronation Street who are the stars of Coronation Street at the moment, nearly every one of them, nearly every one of them is an ex-variety performer. Mm -hmm. See, Bill Waddington was Witty Willie from Lancashire. He was a stand-up comic. Uh, Liz Dawn was a was a sort of club performer singer I believe so was Bill Tarney um, Betty Driver was, mm. a, was, a, was a variety performer I believe the girl who plays Rita was a variety performer you know there's so many if you look at them there's so many variety they take straight from with no acting experience at all and put them straight on so to do drama is to a variety performer is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> you make it sound so easy. <laughs> well, it is, it is easy. I'll, I'll take your word for it. No, no, if you... I'm not talking about working on the stage. No. Because there you have to project, you have to make it real for three hours, you have to create a character and you have to keep it going so it's consistent all the way through. You have to deal with all those things on the stage. When it comes to doing situation comedy, at the end of the day, you have to do it live to an audience, you know? That's, an, again, an entirely different technique because not only do you have to make it look real, you have to do it loud enough so the studio audience can hear it, so they laugh. So that is not easy. That is, you know, that's not easy to do a situation comedy. But drama, I promise you, you could earn a fortune. Could I? <laughs> a plug for your pantomime, please. Yeah, well, um, it's nearly over anyway. I'm only doing three and a half weeks and it's sold out anyway. But um, we're doing Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs at the Yvonne Arno, in, in where I am at the moment. And, um, yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's wholesome. It's, it doesn't have any, no, not even the suggestion of a suggestive joke. And um, uh, it's a wonderful company. I mean, uh, I don't think there's a weak performer in it in fact I know there isn't um, everybody's superb and uh, it's a lovely theatre the theatre itself is in wonderful a wonderful uh, a visual mm. aspect with all the the river running around it it's lovely the 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 staff the front of house staff backstage everybody they they couldn't be more helpful um, as you can see my dressing room is almost like a a sweet, it's a palatial. It's lovely. You're very relaxed. <laughs> well, I've got, I, I'm, as you can see, I'm lying on a bed. I've got a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful television right in front of me. I've got my fridge, I've got my radio, I've got everything laid on. I've got my phone, so if I want anything sending down from the restaurant, they send it. I mean, oh. it's paradise. Not bad for an old comic, is it really? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, you're right. Your lovely new wife, Tonya Byrne. Since we last met, you got married, didn't you? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Well, Tonya was a, you know, a girlfriend in the 50s, you know, when I was a bit of a, a, bit of a lad, uh, to, to say the least. And uh, after I'd been widowed for about six or seven years, I bumped into her in L.A. And uh, within days, we, you know, I'd met her again. And we, we um, started up, up a, 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 our old friendship, in a way. It's, it was as if we'd never been apart. I hadn't seen her for 34 years <laughs> and uh, it, it happened, it all happened within a month and it seemed the right thing to do. I mean, we're the bo both about the same age. Um, 
she's a performer. She and has spent a lot of her time with somebody who is in the public eye, so she knows how to handle that. And That's it's right. Very difficult when you when you are in the public eye. It's very difficult for uh, lots of ladies to um, recognise the fact that that the that the public. Um, want to speak to you all the time or you know I mean I'm delighted they want to speak to you or you know come up and have a chat to you in restaurants and things like that and it's something that that you know you, one lives with I mean I not only does one live with it, I mean I encourage it and I like it somebody wants to talk to me and be friendly I love it Bill thank you so much for talking to me great thrill to meet you once again ah, it's a pleasure lots of luck with heartbeat and whatever you choose to do in the future yeah thank you well I'm 68 now so you know I've, I, you know, I, I, really, I, I should retire, but you can't because it's too easy. <laughs> You've also got someone from the Isle of Wight, Simon Lee, in this current production, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice lad, and a very good performer too. He's um, he's got a nice voice, and the most charming lady, you know, Karen Worth. Who's uh, she's got a lovely voice, and she's the sweetest person, one of the sweetest persons I think I've ever met. Far too good for him. If I wasn't married, I'd nick her. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, happy new year and thank you so much and good luck. Thank you, John. It's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. It's great. He's got a swell personality. He meets and greets the stars with such amenity. Good enough to make you coming out of the street. John Hannah May. That's right. Happy memories there of the very last time I ever met Bill Maynard, which was in 1996 in Guildford. Incidentally, in my new book, the John Hannam Showbiz Interviews, featuring nearly a hundred star names from British showbiz, there is a feature on Bill Maynard. If you're interested, please go to my website, johnhannam.com, and click on the writing page to see how you can buy it online. Keep looking on the Isle of Wight radio website, the John Hannam website and YouTube for more John Hannam Meets new interviews. Bye-bye for now. Isle of Wight Radio